It was bold. It was brilliant. It was the future of home hi-fi. And it crashed. Hard. But for a few short years, it was magic. Magic that completely confused the hell out of everyone. This is the story of quadraphonic sound, a technology that promised music all around you and ended up buried under its own ambition. Welcome to the Audio Lab, I'm Peter Thompson. And if you love sound, hi-fi history, and chasing that perfect listening moment, you're in the right place. Hit subscribe, it only takes a few milliseconds. Give it a like and let's grow this channel together. Today we're spinning up the tale of how four channel sound nearly changed the world and why it didn't. I'll never forget it. Uh, down at Phillip Island, our family's uh, weekend uh, shack, Dad had a mate down there, a local real estate agent, uh, who owned this incredible quadraphonic system. Four speakers in the corners, a glowing silver receiver, and a record spinning something called a quadradisc. When he dropped the needle, the whole room opened up. Vocals in front of me, guitars behind, reverb wrapping around me like a wave. That was the first time I realised Stereo wasn't the full picture, and I was hooked. By the late 1960s, stereo was the standard. Record labels were hunting for the next big thing. Studios were already recording on four and eight track machines, so why not playback in four channels too? On paper, it made sense. In practice, it turned in one of the messiest format wars in hi-fi history. Everyone wanted to be the future of sound, and nobody wanted to play nice. Between 1970 and 1976, five competing systems fought for control, each claiming to be the quadraphonic revolution. Let's walk through them. Developed by CBS Laboratories, SQ aimed to make quad simple and accessible. It folded four channels into two and decoded them back out using phase tricks. It was fully backward compatible. You could play SQ records on any stereo turntable. That made it attractive, but separation was weak. Only three to six decibels, and the decoding rarely worked the same twice. CBS poured millions into it. Ad campaigns, SQ demo albums, even FM broadcast trials. But tuning drift and inconsistent hardware killed the illusion. Labels like Columbia, Epic and EMI, hardware from Sony, Fisher, Lafayette and Sylvania, artists, Santana, Chicago, Miles Davis, Blood, Sweat and Tears. They released around 700 albums in that format. The cost to go SQ? A quad receiver with built-in SQ decoding ran four to six hundred US dollars in 1973. Roughly three to four thousand today, plus another few hundred for four matching speakers. Affordable to audiophiles, but out of the reach of the average household. Developed by Sansui Electric and engineer Raisuko Ito, QS offered smoother diagonal imaging and a more natural soundstage. Then, Sansui launched the Vario Matrix decoder, which dynamically steered the image and boosted rear separation to more than 20 decibels. It was technically brilliant and genuinely musical. Even when played in stereo, SQ still sounded wide and alive. Japan loved it. The rest of the world barely noticed. Labels were Decca, ABC, Dunhill, Ovation, King Records Japan, hardware by Sansui, Akai, Kenwood and Pioneer. Artists, The Moody Blues, Joan Baez, Elton John, The Who. They released about 600 albums in this format. The cost? A Sansui QRX receiver ran about seven to 800 US, nearly 5,000 today. And with a turntable and speakers, you were north of 1,000, a serious investment in 1973. QS sounded fantastic, but it was an enthusiast format, not a mainstream one. Now for the heavy hitter, CD4, created by JVC and RCA. This was true, discrete, four-channel sound. No matrixing, no guesswork. It used a 30 kilohertz ultrasonic carrier in the groove to encode the rear channels. When demodulated correctly, it gave crystal clear separation and sounded spectacular. But it was brutally unforgiving. To make CD4 work, you needed a Shibata stylus, a CD4 modulator, low capacitance cables, and flawless vinyl. One bit of dust, one scratch, and goodbye rear channels. Labels were RCA, Warner Brothers, Atlantic, Polydor, JVC. 
Hardware from JVC, Technics, Marantz, Jewel and Pioneer. Artists, Jefferson Airplane, John Denver, Black Sabbath, The Doors, Joni Mitchell, John Lennon. This format released about 500 albums. The cost to go CD4? A proper CD4 rig, receiver, demodulator, cartridge, cables, around about 850 to 1100 US, or around 6,000 in today's money. And that's before the hours of cartridge alignment and swearing. When it works, CD4 was glorious. When it didn't, it was a heartbreak in four channels. Before any of them, there was EV4 from Electrovoice. Launched in 1969, it was the first commercial quad format. Simple, inexpensive, and already obsolete by 1971. Channel separation was barely four decibels, but it proved people wanted music all around them. Labels were Vanguard, Ovation, Audio Fidelity. Hardware was from Radio Shack, Heathkit, and Lafayette. There were about 200 albums released in this format. The cost? About 250 to 300 US. And that was for a full kit in 1970. Roughly 2000 today. Cheap, cheerful, and outdated almost instantly. And last, Denon's UD4, sometimes called UMX. A hybrid system, blending matrix and discrete carriers, it aimed to deliver CD4 fidelity without the headaches. Technically, it worked beautifully. Commercially, it went nowhere. It launched late, sold only in Japan, and was mostly used for demo and jazz records. Labels were Denon, Nippon Columbia. Hardware from Denon with receivers and turntables. They only released about 40 albums on this format. The cost? Roughly 200,000 yen, about 650 US dollars in 1976, or 3,700 in today's money. Not outrageous, but impossible to justify when no one else used the format. By 1976, the results were in. Across all the formats, roughly 5 to 6 million LPs were sold worldwide, less than 2% of the stereo market. Five systems, five sets of hardware, five different logos, and almost nobody could play them all. Quad's downfall was not the sound, it was the fuss. These systems were temperamental, inconsistent, and brutally unforgiving. To get them working, you needed precision alignment, matched speakers, and the right decoder. Matrix systems could sound amazing one moment and collapse into mush the next. Dealers could demo it beautifully, but when customers went home, they'd lost the magic. And with all those tiny logos and no standards, most buyers didn't even know what they owned at home. By 1977, Quad was dead. A great idea buried under confusion. Even as home users gave up, the studios pushed ahead. Abbey Road, A&M and JVC all built Quad mixing setups. BBC in the UK tested Matrix HFM Quad. CBS in the US tested SQ FM broadcasts. NHK in Japan broadcast CD4 and UD4 quad programs. These experiments directly influenced early surround cinema standards. The consumer systems failed, but the research transformed studio acoustics and mixing practice. Quad didn't vanish, it evolved. Those same decoding concepts powered Dolby Surround and later ProLogic, thanks to Jim Foscate, one of the original quad pioneers. Every modern surround format, 5.1, Atmos, Sony 360 Audio, traces its lineage straight back to the quad era. Fast forward to the early 2000s, I started finding digital quad rips on DVD audio and DTS discs. Alice Cooper, Pink Floyd, Santana, and I played these on my Dolby digital system at home. And there it was again, the same 3D magic I had heard as a kid at Phillip Island. Today, Quad is back, this time as Blu-ray Quadio, SACD 4.0 and lossless remasters. Labels like Rhino are releasing the original Quad mixes in perfect discrete form, no decoders, no guesswork. Half a century later, Quad finally works and it sounds spectacular. Quadraphonic sound was ahead of its time. It wasn't a failure of audio, it was a failure of simplicity, but its DNA lives in every immersive format we use today. For me, it all started in that lounge at Phillip Island. Four speakers, one record, and a sound that blew me away. So if you enjoyed this video, hit subscribe. It takes less than a few milliseconds. Give it a like, and maybe leave a comment. Let me know your quad story. I'm Peter Thompson. This is the Audio Lab. Thanks for watching.